Okay, congestive heart failure. I've already given you my analogy of the McDonald's drive through So right-sided heart failure is going to back up, and that parking lot is going to be the body. And left-sided heart failure, as you back up their parking lot, is the pulmonary system, pulmonary veins. Now, one side, as it backs up, it becomes preload for the other side. So afterload from one side is preload for the other side. Um, and as that progresses, the heart just can't maintain an adequate cardiac output. And here's a diagram that kind of shows some of the things that happen. There's this uh, stimulated stimulation of the cholinergic fibers that trigger things like sweating. And on little kids, you're going to see that, especially on their scalps. And the heart rate is going to go up. The vascular tone to try and maintain um, pressure out going into the periphery is going to go up, which is going to cause less blood flow to the limbs in the long run. So you're going to get delayed capillary refill, weak peripheral pulses, modeling of the skin. And you're also going to have less blood flow to the kidneys, which is going to um, kind of change that water and sodium balance, and you're going to get less urine output. So the symptoms specifically in kids, we're going to see tachycardia, fatigue and weakness. They don't have the reserves. They're going to get tired easily. Restlessness, pale, cool extremities, decreased blood pressure, that's pretty late, and decreased urinary output. If it's pulmonary, so if the parking lot we're filling up is the pulmonary system, you're going to see tachypnea, dyspnea, respiratory distress, those um, labored respirations where you're seeing uh, retractions, exercise intolerance, they get out of breath quick, and cyanosis. If our parking lot that we're filling up is uh, systemic venous congestion, then you're going to get edema, and on kids you'll see periorbital edema the, around the eyes weight gain, and that's why we do daily weights, ascites, which is uh, fluid in the abdomen, uh, hepatomegaly, the liver gets enlarged, that's why at Children's they want us to check liver on everyone, and then neck vein distension. And there's a picture showing those. So our therapeutic management, we're going to try and improve the cardiac function, and we do that with digoxin, that's uh, the medication we use the most. It's also one of the most dangerous medications that we use. And then we'll use ACE inhibitors such as captopril and enalapril. Now we need to get rid of that extra fluid that's either out in the, the system or in the lungs and we'll use diuretics like Lasix, Diuril, and Aldactone. Um, the Aldactone is more sparing of potassium. We may need the kid to be on a fluid restriction and we may need a sodium restriction we need to monitor our potassium levels, partly because the diuretics can waste the potassium, but the digoxin, the digitalis, we have an increased risk of toxicity when we have low potassiums. And continuing on, we want to try and decrease the cardiac demands. So things that make that heart have to work harder, we're going to avoid, like physical activity, we're going to maintain body temperature. Any infections we're going to treat. Keeping the child semi um helps with venous return and um, the cardiac output because of that. And sedating a child. If they're really irritable, they're using up a lot more energy and their heart just can't pump well enough to get the oxygen and, uh, you know, sugar and uh, the what the cells need out to the, the cells, to the tissue. So we may have to sedate them. And then whatever we can to improve the oxygenation to the tissues and also decrease oxygen consumption. So making those uh, muscles not need a lot of oxygen by not being quite as active. When we give digoxin, we always, always, always take an apical pulse for a full minute. One of the effects of, of DIG is to make the heart constrict more strongly, but slower. So we need to know what that apical pulse rate is. 
If it's 70 or less for a child, we hold it. On an infant, the doctor will usually write you a, a level of where you should hold it, but it's going to be somewhere between 90 and 110. Signs and symptoms of DIG toxicity are nausea, vomiting, anorexia, bradycardia, and dysrhythmias. We always check DIG with another nurse, and there should periodically be levels checked, and they should run between 0 0.8 and 2 to be in the therapeutic range. We also need to monitor potassium levels because if they're low, the uh, toxic level um, will be lower. And we often will use ACE inhibitors as well to monitor the blood pressure. And here's the symptoms of DIG toxicity, and here's uh, some information about the other diuretics that we often use. Now, kids, particularly uh, the Tetralogy of Fallot, will have these hypercyanotic spells where they suddenly, things kind of tighten up, the pressures change, and they shunt badly right to left. So all the deoxygenated blood is being sent back to the body, and they look blue. The treatment for that is to place a child in a knee chest position. Many kids, once they're a little bit older, they'll do this automatically themselves. They'll just squat down in uh, that knee chest position. We want to stay calm and comfort them. We want to give them a hundred percent O2 by face mask, try and maximize as much oxygen in the blood as possible. We probably will need to give some morphine to calm them down if they don't calm down quickly. We may need to do fluids and then repeat the morphine. And here's a picture of that knee chest position. You pull the knees up. It um, kind of helps with venous return and then if we can calm them down so that the pressures go back to what they should be so they quit doing quite so much shunting right to left. Here's clubbing of the fingers, and you may have already seen this. This takes a while to develop. You don't develop this quickly, but kids with chronic respiratory or cardiac problems where they're not circulating adequate oxygen for long periods, they'll develop these clubbed fingers. Now, bacterial endocarditis. This is where we get infection in the valves or the lining, the inner part of the heart. Usually it started as bacteremia, so it started as germs in the blood that settled into the heart. Happens frequently if kids have a heart defect, and those germs can get into the blood from dental work, a urinary tract infection during surgery, or any of the uh, IV lines that we have, those indwelling catheters. It's diagnosed using an EKG. They're looking at the PR interval. They'll also have anemia, an elevated uh, ESR, which is a lab showing infection, leukocytosis, uh, hematuria, so blood in the urine. Treated with antibiotics for two to eight weeks, usually on the longer side. And if we know a child's at risk, we want to give them antibiotics before procedures. Rheumatic fever. This is the consequence of scarlet fever. Uh, it's an inflammatory disease of the heart, joints, central nervous system, and sub-Q tissue. You get damage and scarring of the mitral valve. That's the valve between the left atria and the left ventricle. Your left AV valve is your mitral valve. Most important valve of the heart, really. It's caused by that group A beta hemolytic strep. Um, signs are going to be carditis, poly arthritis because it gets your joints as well. You get a rash. A chorea, which is kind of subtle shaking of the extremities, and then sub-Q nodes. Treated with penicillin, erythromycin if you're allergic to it. Salicylates, which is aspirin and bed rest, but if, once you've damaged that heart muscle, it's damaged. I mean, um, heart valve, it's damaged. You can't really undo the damage. And here's a picture of the different symptoms. Kawasaki's disease. Uh, this is an interesting illness. We don't really know what causes it, but it's systemic vasculitis, so all of the blood vessels become inflamed. 75% of the cases are under five years old, and there's three phases to it. The acute phase where the kids come in with a high fever, and nothing brings that fever down. 
antipyretics don't really do it. We put them on an antibiotic thinking they have an infection that doesn't come down. Then they go to a subacute phase where the fever has gone, but they still have the other symptoms, and then a convalescence stage where the visible signs are gone, but their lab values have not come back to normal. And these are the symptoms. They have to have five out of these six, but they have to have fever. Fever for five or more days, and then they can have um, conjunctivitis, basically, but without the exudate. So it's sort of like pink eye, except there's no drainage. Oral mucosa uh, becomes dry and cracked, and they get a strawberry tongue. Their tongue will really be red changes to the extremities and the one you see most often is this peeling of the palms and the soles of the feet. It turns red and then it peels. They get a rash on their trunk and enlarged lymph nodes, uh, cervical lymphadenitis. And here's kind of a picture of what's going on. The biggest problem is with the ones we don't see which is that if you see kind of that aorta um, through that upper abdomen there where it says vascular or aneurysms that's the concern we get um, aneurysms in the aorta or in the uh, the arteries that supply the heart with blood the coronary arteries those get damaged and that can be a permanent uh, if those are damaged it's often very serious so our treatment is to try and prevent that vasculitis to, to keep those vessels from um, developing aneurysms or problems. So we treat it during the acute phase with IV immunoglobulins and high doses of aspirin. Normally we don't give aspirin to kids, in Kawasaki's we do, it's the primary treatment. After the fever, that acute phase is gone, then we go to a lower dose of aspirin, which is more of an antiplatelet level. Shock. Uh, in shock, we don't have adequate blood flow to perfuse our tissues. And what we'll see is hypotension, tissue hypoxia, well, when those tissues have to work without oxygen, all of the metabolic um, waste products are acidotic, they're having to metabolize less effectively, they make more acid waste products, and we don't have good perfusion to wash it out and bring them to the kidneys where they get flushed out. So we end up with metabolic acidosis. Kids are going to look like their skin is cold and clammy. They'll usually have that modeling. They'll have poor cap refill, decreased urine output, and then lactic acidosis. If we do a, a blood gas, we'll see metabolic acidosis. On the exam, these other things, we're not going to, will not be on my exam. You should have those on your adult med search. Uh, 